Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. This is the first time using Zoom for me, so uh, it's a new uh, new experience. Um, so I'm going to talk through today a little bit of a, a, a SolGel um, system that we've been looking at and actually using uh, various types of uh, small angle scattering and, and other synchrotron techniques as well um, to, to really start to understand the system. Um, but just a bit of an intro to the system, the material itself, uh, you know, in case people aren't familiar, um, the, the material we've been working with uh, recently is this um, uh, iron carbide material, Fe3C. The, uh, ooh, hang on a second. Uh, so it's actually a, a historically really important uh, material in geology, in, uh, in historical materials, and then in, um, uh, in, in industry, the steel industry is, is the most important sort of region of this, um, where this material uh, is used. Um, what we're particularly interested in is making uh, nanoparticles of this material because more recently uh, the area of interest for this material is in, in things like uh, catalysis and electrocatalysis uh, and, and also in terms of the magnetic properties of, of this material, so maybe using it in, uh, in magnetic nanoparticles, for example, in various uh, medical um, applications. Um, so the way the approaches we've been using to try and uh, produce uh, nanostructures of this material is a sol gel sol gel chemistry method just a really simple introduction to sol gel chemistry for if you're not familiar um we start with this sol so i'm just trying to see if i can get a uh annotation i was able to do this earlier but for some reason now it's not working uh, okay never mind um the uh the the, the sol um oh here we go annotate there we go uh draw uh arrow here we go okay so yeah right you can see these Perfect. Um, so the sol um, is, is basically any sort of dispersion in water, okay? So the dispersion in, in solution, sorry. So the dispersion could be little tiny particles or little segments of polymer, but where you've got little uh, tiny dispersion of some sort of uh, solid in, in solution, you undergo some sort of gel process to make a gel that could be particles of a colloid or a polymer forming a gel, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the key stage really for, for, for us is, is then heating that system to um, to make some sort of ceramic material. That ceramic material for us is the uh, is the uh, iron carbide. So specifically, the uh, chemistry that we've been using uh, to make the iron carbide is this sol gel root. Uh, it's, the actual chemistry is is really easy. We take some sort of iron salt. Typically, we use iron nitrate. Uh, we mix it with this gelatin polymer. I'll come on to that in a minute. We make some sort of gel. Uh, the, the the material is actually um, at room temperature, it's a gel. At slightly higher temperature, it's a very viscous, sticky solution. Uh, and then the the actual transformation to the um, uh, to the to the metal carbide nanoparticles occurs around well on the way up to 800 degrees C in the atmosphere. And then you can see here in the in the uh, TEM and SEM images, we've got these nice um, nanoparticles of the material. So I mean, it's a natural material, naturally suitable material for looking at with small angle scattering, really to understand on a bulk scale what is happening with these uh, with these um, nanoparticles and the sort of sizes that we're getting. And um, let's click to the next one. So this is the, the polymer itself. This becomes important later on. The polymer is a polypeptide. Gelatin is used in gummy bears, gummy version. Um, if I've got my German right, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> um, and the gelatin uh, polypeptide, the way it's believed to form these uh, gels uh, in, in water, it's believed that the polypeptide forms these triple helical uh, junction zones where three strands of the polymer come together to form these sort of rod-like um, helices uh, within the structure. And with these tangling points, that's what's then trapping the the, uh, the the water within this sort of gel structure. So this, as I said, this model for gelatin has been around for many decades uh, and, and does actually become important later when we think about some of the scattering we can do uh, in this uh, system. So let's go to the next one. What does this actually look like? So this is what the solution looks like. You've added the gelatin solution, you've added the iron nitrate solution, and it's this sort of gloopy, sort of red brown solution this depends on the concentration basically uh, if it's sort of relatively dilute it's sort of maybe like honey uh, becomes more concentrated it becomes more like maybe a sticky like treacle and then it really concentrated it becomes like a almost like a, a jelly sweet basically so the, the viscosity when the viscosity is high it's really sort of sticky and stretchy the interesting part uh, which we'll come back to later is when you dry this solution so you dry before you do the the the, the calcination process 
um, you dry around 80 degrees C and, and the, the solution gradually dries down and dries down through the beaker, forms a sort of sticky, viscous mixture at the bottom, and then this gradually puffs up to form this uh, foam. Uh, that foam structure is maintained during the pyrolysis. So you take the foam, you heat to 800 degrees C in nitrogen, uh, and the result is the foam, it contracts slightly, so it sort of shrinks uh, a bit, um, but the foam structure is, is maintained uh, really nicely. There's some um, electron microscopy images of the foam. Uh, so what we've actually got is a carbon foam, so the gelatin polymer has decomposed to a carbon foam, and then embedded, you can see this speckly appearance, I hope you can see anyway, the speckly appearance on this TEM image, and then a zoom in area, uh, uh, section of that TEM image here you can see the nanoparticles so we've got a carbon foam with embedded nanoparticles of the of the um, iron carbide material so we didn't intend to make this foam what we were aiming for was some iron carbide nanoparticles but actually if you're thinking of applications in catalysis for example where you want large quantities of a fluid gas or liquid to flow over catalytic nanoparticles then actually a foam structure is is um, is quite attractive so um, we've uh, we've spent a lot of time First of all, trying to understand how these nanoparticles form, but also actually trying to understand how this foam structure um, forms. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about the later stages because um, uh, it, it's actually the foam formation that I wanted to talk about mainly today. So we've done, done some really, really loads of stuff. Um, the PXRD is the work we've already done that's, uh, that's published on most of this is done at uh, Diamond uh, Light Source in, in the UK. Um, wax and sax on I-22 and then PDF on I-15-1 uh, at Diamond as well. This is just a, um, a plot of the wax data um, from, uh, from, from I-22, which I mean, it's really beautiful. You can see the, the, the first stage we get some iron oxide nanoparticles nucleating. They hang around for quite a long time uh, and then there's a lot of stuff happening um, in this short region here. You get the formation, uh, let me see, hang on, let me see if I can draw, here we go, some circles. One two, three, these are the iron nitride peaks. So we form very briefly some iron nitride and then we go into this iron carbide phase. So I have a postdoc at the moment who's working on, so we have SACS data for all of this, uh, this whole process. So going from the iron oxide to iron nitride to iron carbide. So I'm pretty excited to sort of see what we get from this, you know, learning about how the particles evolve in the system, how they grow um, and, and whether we can learn from that, maybe how to control that, that growth of the particles better. So I think it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. And as I said, I think there is a lot to learn about this um, later stage of the process. And in similar systems as well, so we've, we've looked at um, making iron carbides in different systems, and this is data, data with the mouse. And I just want to show this as you know, examples of, of, of how we've used um, SACS in, in analyzing uh, lots of systems with um, iron carbide. Uh, these particular ones looking at mixtures of iron carbide with uh, magnesium oxide and really looking at these bimodal distributions where you can see the, the one particle size, uh, this is the magnesium oxide um, distributions and then the iron carbide distributions um, as well and trying to sort of pick apart uh, the contributions of different, um, different parts of the system. But um, so we, as I said, we've used SACS a lot to really look at the iron carbide phase, but, but I wanted to talk today about the, actually um, uh, the, the, the what happens at, at the very low temperatures and really how we've used scattering to understand what happens in, in, our, in our polymer system and really understand why the, the, the features and the structures we get in the polymer in the solution lead to the formation of this foam structure, you know, understand what's going on here. And as I said, foam structures are really important uh, in terms of making uh, ceramic catalysts. So if we can learn about this, then maybe we can control it to make even more diverse materials. Um, and really this is a mixture of, I know mainly today, uh, it's, a, it's a scattering workshop, I know mainly the, the focus is on x-ray scattering, but whilst the data I'm gonna show you is neutron scattering, I think some of the things I've learned through this are applicable generally to, to scattering. And it's been for me a really interesting story as, as coming from a background of experimental material science to really you know, launch myself into this field of scattering, which at the beginning can seem quite daunting. Um, and so I, hopefully this makes, makes quite a nice uh, story. So as I said, we used actually a mixture of just pure simple chemistry and observations, some science, and then t uh, tallied that with some, some neutron scattering really to understand this uh, system. So what we're trying to understand is why is it when you get, you take your iron nitrate solution and your gelatin solution, you mix them together and you get this foam. So the simplest first thing to do is say, okay, well, this happens with iron nitrate. So what other metal nitrates can we do this with? 
And generally, it's pretty uh, diverse. So you can take a whole load of different nitrates, be that nitric acid or different metal nitrates, and you can make these foam structures. This seems to be sort of fairly general. TMAN, this is tetramethyl ammonium nitrate. Um, so we can elucidate from, from these experiments that, um, and this is the, the systems once they've been uh, pyrolyzed. So we can see they all make these foam-like structures. I mean, you can see these are all at a, approximately the same scale. You can see that, you know, some of them have really large open bubbles, some have much smaller bubbles. So there's clearly something going on here, but all of them drive this foaming process, okay? The, the temperature at which the foaming happens can vary, but, but it seems to be common across a lot of different uh, systems. The presence of nitrate is important. So we tried some systems with, uh, with other salts and, and didn't get so much foaming. Um, but the presence of a metal is important for small bubbles. So you can see here where we've got tetramethyl ammonium nitrate and also a system where we have uh, nitric acid. Um, we, uh, we don't get such tiny bubbles. So the metal is, is clearly important somehow in the foam formation. We'll come back to that a little bit later. One issue is that metal nitrates are acidic and it's something we had to consider that this that low pH is actually important in the system. Again, that's something we'll come back to later. It's, I think this slide hopefully just gives an impression of, of some of the things we had to consider and the complexity of the system, uh, all the different factors that might be influencing this foaming uh, process. So an obvious uh, experiment to do was some uh, TGA, some thermogravimetric analysis, coupled with mass spec, to just try and understand, okay, well, if you're creating a foam when the system is drying, you know, some gas is having to be produced to make those bubbles in that foam. So what is that gas? Um, and we did find some um, traces of, uh, of, um, of nitrate, of nitrous oxides uh, in TGMS. Uh, but the main thing that we see uh, in TGMS, the main sort of um, uh, peak in the in the uh, in the mass spec associated with uh, the mass loss in the system is water. So the main gas that we can see some nitrous oxides, but really water is the is the primary contrib contribution to the system. So it does seem like a lot of the foaming process is driven purely by evaporation of water from the system. So as the water becomes steam uh, and evaporates off um, the system, we think that is the main thing that is driving uh, bubble formation. Um, so again, this is a lot of the science we did in this, this experiment was just to sort of try and study in a better way what we could actually just see with our own eyes. So we could see, for example, if we took a, a gelatin, a hot gelatin solution, so gelatin at room temperature is, is a gel, the jello that you make in your kitchen, for example, uh, you warm it up and it becomes like a runny, um, slightly viscous solution. And we could see easily if we tip some iron nitrate into the solution, it went really sort of gloopy and, and sticky. You know, so we can see that with our eyes, you know, we didn't need a scientific technique to tell us this, um, but the scientific techniques were quite instructive in, in telling us uh, a little bit more and proving what we could see with our eyes, but also helping us to learn about it. So rheology was quite interesting. And, and this is uh, some rheology data looking at, so zero moles per liter, this is the uh, just plain gelatin, the black line here. And then all of these other ones is, is, is an increasing amount of, um, of um, iron nitrate uh, as we go down through along this. Uh, arrow. Uh, and what we can see with the uh, rheology data, the G prime and G double prime, um, that as we add um, an increasing amount of iron nitrate to our system, our gelatin goes from being in a viscoelastic solid to a viscoelastic liquid. So again, we're just confirming something we can see with our eyes, but it's just a way of, of measuring it and, and, uh, and quantifying it. So we know we can learn from this that our, something about the iron is disrupting that gel structure of the gelatin. If you remember the, the structure I showed you with the um, uh, with those with those triple helices, it's breaking up that that gelatin gel. Um, even at room temperature, it forms a sticky a sticky solution rather than a pure gel. So something about it is changing the way those polymers are binding um, together. Um, another thing we looked at was can we uh, study how the iron is binding, how the metals are binding to this gelatin polymer. Um, various reasons we can't use UV vis well iron is, is a colored a very strongly colored ion and in the different conditions it, it changes color um, it, uh, I, yeah I won't go into that now but UV vis was was out of the picture um, so we did find some evidence from infrared spectroscopy to suggest the metal is binding to that gelatin uh, polymer backbone um, so you know, uh, so there's some evidence to show that the metal or further evidence to show the metal is actually binding to that um, to the to the, the polymer itself so really at this point we had we had a lot of evidence to sort of show that that the iron was interacting with the gelatin that different factors of the, of, about the system were causing you know the water was causing the thing to foam 
but really we wanted to know okay well what's what's actually happening to the metal uh, to the sorry sorry to the polymer in the system what's happening to that gelatin polymer when we add this uh, iron nitrate and so this is where uh, small angle neutron scattering uh, came into the picture and this is where Really, you know, I'd done some sacks with, um, with Brian before, but mainly it had been Brian and my husband, who was also a scatterer, Martin, you hear from him, I think, tomorrow, um, uh, who, who did most of the data analysis. And then they sort of showed me the data analysis and then work, worked with me to sort of talk about what it might mean for my system. This was the first system where really I did all the data collection and really addressed the data analysis itself. So it sort of gave me a real insight into the challenges of, of scattering and, and really discovering what is physically reasonable um, and, or balancing what is physically reasonable against a good fit, basically. So this is the just the, what the first set of data we collected. We took a gelatin system. So this is our model system that people have accepted since like 1960s of so the gelatin forming these triple helices. Uh, so we took gelatin uh, at room temperature and then we heated it up past the salt, the gel salt transition. So this is gelatin when it is runny. So you've broken up the gel structure uh, and we did got small angle neutron scattering data for both of those points. And you can see actually the, the data points are pretty similar for, um, for both of those regions, the gel and the salt region. So because um, I was relatively new, as I said, to this field of, of neutron scattering, the first thing I did was say, okay, well, what have other people done in the literature around Gelatin. I'm not going to put the reference to this paper because uh, whilst I think there are some issues with this, this paper, it is still really nice science. They just, I think maybe we're a bit, uh, how do I put this democratically? Um, I, I think it's instructive in showing how maybe you can get a little too enthusiastic with fitting um, and, and maybe you need to consider what is uh, physically realistic. So I'd say the first thing about this paper, to me, as a, again, I'm an experimental materials chemist. I spent my whole life, you know, making samples and, and analyzing them. I wasn't uh, from, a, from a scattering background. So it's, it's quite off-putting, you know, from that background to come and see, you know, a lot of maths and the discussion. But, but what really made me interested was, um, was this uh, region here. So they talk about this, this Q region in their, uh, their system. Uh, and they rationalize this, the way they fitted their data to get the line fit uh, to, to understand their system. This, I, should, I should say this is a gelatin system at room temperature in, in D2O, so similar to what we were measuring. Uh, the way they fitted it, they used a, um, uh, a rod-like structure to model this gelatin triple helix. So if we just go back here, they said, okay, we've got these triple helices in gelatin where the, the polymer is twisted together. That's gonna take approximately the shape of a rod and so we're going to rationalize this, this region of our data uh, as a rod-like component that uh, goes in with the fitting. Now, what I discovered when I really sort of started digging down into this paper and then comparing it to my own data was, okay, well, they, they used this fitting, but actually what they didn't do was take a gelatin gel and heat it above the soil transition to test whether this rod-like structure was then going to disappear. Because in theory, when you melt gelatin, you go to the soil state and you unravel all the triple helices, uh, you should no longer have those rods in the system. Uh, these, these, these rods here should disappear and become basically like a, a, just an open network where all the polymers are floating freely in solution. This is the accepted model for gelatin. What we found when we did scattering on this system, you can see a, you know, some small differences in the, in the scattering, but really it's not significant. You know, and it seemed maybe a little unreasonable to, to say, okay, well, you know, we can use this rod-like structure. So at the time for me, this was really frustrating because you know it's sort of a case of well ah, you know how do i how do i go about fitting this data and and how can i sort of agree and you know how can i use the you know stuff that is in in literature and you know can i trust it basically in, in fitting my own data um and it made me really question well how am i going to fit this data and really the revelation to me in this work was to say okay well hang on a second before i do any fitting before i worry about getting this really nice line and i you know my lines are not exactly perfect i'll come back to that later ha, you know I, I got so caught up in worrying about how i was going to get this nice line that i forgot to maybe step back and say okay well what is actually this data telling me even before i try and fit it i know in some systems it's not so easy to do that but i think it's it's nice to show how in this system it really it really worked well so i took a step back for a bit and then um, actually i got in touch with a guy at nist who's who's done a lot of uh, neutral scattering with um with polymers and, and he helped me through this but what we discovered was, was actually we didn't need to fit the data at all in the system, which, which is, is really nice. So 
We did some experiments where we did sands of gelatin. So this is plain gelatin at the bottom here. There's zero moles per liter, that's, there's no iron. And as we go up, we're increasing the concentration of iron nitrate as we're adding it to our gelatin. Um, uh, and as you increase the iron to gelatin ratio, you can see this guinea region here, the, the turnaround point basically in the data uh, shifts to a higher Q. So um, this, this guy, Nist Bulem Hamuda, um, has done a lot of work on both synthetic and biological polymers using very simple fitting methods, just simple poly polymer correlation uh, model. Um, and, and basically what we can sort of take from this is uh, this and this shift to a higher Q in this sort of turnaround point is to say, okay, what we're probably getting in this system uh, is a contraction of that polymer. So basically the polymer becoming more sort of contracted in the, uh, in the, in the solution. Um, oh, hang on a second, why is this not? I'll go back to the mouse. There we go. Uh, as we continue to add iron, we shift back to that lower Q, which indicates our, uh, our gelatin, our polyelectrolyte, our polymer is, uh, is expanding in solution. I'll show some diagrams in a minute to make it clearer what I mean about that. And then at very high, um, at very high concentration, uh, the suggestion is you've just got a more sort of broader fractal network. What does that actually mean? I, I'm always conscious with these systems that that it's always important to step back and say, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the, in terms of what's happening in my system? What does that mean in terms of the chemistry? And, and when you think about it and start to analyze the system, you say, okay, well, actually this is really reasonable. Okay, so gelatin is a polypeptide. Okay, a polypeptide is made up of a sequence of amino acids. Lots of different amino acids have lots of different side chains. You might have amines or carboxylic acids, uh, hydroxyls, lots of different side chains uh, on this polymer that could be positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral, depending on the pH of your system. Okay, what you're doing is you're taking that polyelectrolyte and you're adding an acidic solution to it. Okay, iron nitrate is acidic. So we'll forget for the minute that the iron actually binds to the polymer. All we care about for the minute is the fact that iron nitrate um, itself um, is, is a strongly acidic uh, solution. Okay, and so by changing the pH, you are gonna change your polymer conformation and solution. That's basic, um, uh, that's basic uh, polyelectrolyte chemistry, okay? So if we look at what, um, at, at what happens when we, when we go up through these, uh, these increasing concentrations, we get that shift in that Guinea region uh, in, our, in our scattering data. Hang on, let me add some arrows to this. So there we go, that's our, our first stage where we get that shift in that turnaround point. Um, so you've got all your, your various uh, uh, polyelectrolyte side chains. So for example, you've got your uh, CO2, minus groups or CO2H groups, you've got amines on there. So if you've got any negatively charged groups on your polymer, like CO2, it's carboxylate groups on the side chains of your polymer, then as you add your iron uh, nitrate, uh, your acidic iron nitrate solution to that, those are gonna be protonated. Okay, so if you go from having negatively charged groups on your, on your polymer to, the, to neutralizing them, then what's that, what that's gonna do to your polymer is make it contract. Okay, the, uh, the polymer, if it had negative charges on it, those negative charges are going to repel. This is quite simple chemistry when you come down to it. Those negative charges will repel and cause that polymer to stretch out. If you neutralize them, if you, if you protonate them with the, increasing, uh, with the increasing amount of the acidic iron nitrate solution, you're going to neutralize the polymer. That polymer is going to allow itself to contract uh, back down. Okay, as you then increase, uh, let's do another arrow, increase the concentration even further, shift that guinea region back down to a lower Q again. What's happening there? You're increasing the amount of your acidic polymer again. What you're then doing is then protonating some of your neutral amine groups. So you're gonna get NH3 plus groups uh, on the side of your polymer. You've now got a positively charged polymer, positive charges repelling, you're stretching out your polymer again. So really what we're seeing in terms of the, of the uh, neutron scattering without doing any fitting, uh, is, is we're able to sort of pick out something that seems physically realistic based on the chemistry of what's happening uh, in our system. And, and we'll talk about what we mean, what, what, um, what this sort of formation of this sort of fractal network might, might, might mean a little later on. So can we, in a second, let me clear those arrows. So can we get other data to sort of back up? You know, we've come to this conclusion from our, from our neutron scattering data and said, okay, well, you know, this seems physically reasonable based on based on what we can observe and what we know about the chemistry of our gelatin polymer, which is a very well-studied molecule, uh, can, we, can we back this up with some other evidence as well? So a nice technique you can do is uh, circular dichroism spectrophotometry. Uh, this looks for um, uh, chiral regions within, your, within, a, within a system. Okay, so you get this peak representing the, uh, uh, a chiral um, 
uh, region in your system. Gelatin forms these triple helices and they're chiral. They always uh, rotate around in the same uh, direction. And we can see, so this line at the bottom, this blue line here is, is no iron. And then as we increase, hang on, let me again draw an arrow on here. As we increase the concentration of iron, we lose this peak in the circular dichroism, okay? So we lose our, our heat, we're basically losing our helices. So this is sort of backing up this idea that as we add the iron, we're, we're basically disrupting this gelatin helix and we're, and we're breaking apart this structure. Um, and, and, uh, and it's sort of more evidence that the iron and the, the acidity is, is all contributing to this, this breakup of the, of the gelatin system and formation of a different uh, structure. Hang on, clear, clear all drawings. So at this point, we, we kind of um, can come up with a, and, and we did go ahead and fit the data. As I said, we used a really simple uh, polymer correlation model uh, to, um, to do this. So I've just got a couple more minutes, Brian, and then I will be finished. Um, so we did, we, we used this polymer correlation model mainly to sort of find the, the this guinea point, the turnaround point, and look at, to see whether we could get, um, uh, uh, values for sort of the correlation length within these polymers and sort of put numbers to the system. But I just think it's a really nice story because it's, it's a system where, you know, we could draw all our conclusions based on, on the data and then worry about the fitting afterwards. So it was, it was, um, it, as I said, for me, it was really instructive as to sort of really breaking this, breaking the ice and breaking the barrier with scattering as a, and as an experimental scientist to, to really understand how, it, how powerful it could be uh, for, for our systems. Um, so in terms of this mechanism, so we know we add the iron nitrate to the gelatin, it breaks down this normal gel structure. That's It's changing the way the polymer is conformed, so it's causing this contraction and expansion, but it's also disrupting these chiral uh, triple helices and breaking those apart. We know we can look at various other data, the IR, for example, to look at uh, how the iron is, is binding to the polymer. We, we can say, okay, well, you know, it's reasonable to, to say that the iron is actually linking to that polymer. Rheology can tell us how that's changing the uh, the elastic nature of our, our system, our gelatin system. Um, and, uh, and there's the possibility that the nitrate and the acid are reacting with the gelatin to produce gases. Um, but uh, as I said, I think actually that, uh, that a lot of the gases have come from just pure um, uh, evaporation of water. So it, it's, um, hang on, let me remove the drawings again. Yeah, here we go. So it's a nice system because it's it's sort of shown us um, really how um, you know we we've added a metal to a very simple polymer, a gelatin. We've changed the viscoelastic properties of those through the metal sort of changing the conformation of the polymer and the metal binding to that polymer. And because you've changed the viscoelastic properties, when this thing dries and, the, and all the air bubbles form, whether they're water or whether they're this nitrous oxide gas, it doesn't really matter. As they're forming, they're, they're allowing, because this, um, this, you produce this viscoelastic uh, liquid, that, that's able to then support the formation of those bubbles and allow it to sort of puff up and dry as this foam. And what we've done since then is show that different metals can change the way this foam structure forms. You can get small bubbles and big bubbles. It really allows us a way to sort of tune the formation of a foam, foam structure and, and maybe make some ceramic foams of different shapes and sizes and different properties, um, really from a system that just does everything itself. You know, you don't have to control this. You just put it in an oven and let it dry. And we've, you know, through using things like sounds, we've been able to sort of understand why that happens and, and, and how we can and maybe control it a bit, which is which has been really nice. And so I guess, yeah, I mean, I know there's, you know, people coming to this uh, to this workshop who, who maybe have more of a background in, in, in scattering or, or the sort of math side. But as I said, I, I came from this as a synthetic materials chemist and and really as a sort of looking at scattering as being sort of a, quite a daunting thing when you're coming from an experimental background. Um, that, and learning through this, as I said, to start with the data, but also really always considering what is physically reasonable, you know, to, you know, we found this sort of paper in the literature, which as I said, the science and the rest of the paper was really good, but, you know, I found it really interesting that they hadn't, they'd sort of come up with this model and used this model for fitting these rod-like structures without actually doing the simple experiment of, okay, well, what happens when you heat your gelatin up and lose, you know, essentially lose those rod-like models, do you still get the same scattering pattern? Um, so it's sort of really taught me to always consider what is physically reasonable in your system. And that's something that's helped me a lot when it's come then to more complex systems and looking at say um, some of the SACS data we've got on our, on our multi-component systems um, from the mouse and, and really using that to understand our systems. Um, so it's been, it's been really uh, instructive. 
Okay, so all of these people worked on this, uh, on the neutron work. Obviously, thanks more broadly as well to say Brian and Glenn, have, uh, we've got a couple of papers published now and, um, and another one just went in last week as well. So uh, it's, been, it's been great to, to work with you guys. And as I said, this, this experience has been a little strange because I have no audience in front of me and I can't hear any responses, but I hope, I hope it's, been, uh, it's been useful. Thank you. So if I talk, can people hear me? So it just might be easy. I'm not so quick at typing, so it's uh, maybe a little easier to. <laughs> yeah, the, um, ah, yeah, so this question about the matrix. Um, uh, so if you're making an oxide ceramic, obviously this, this is not an issue because the, the gelatin burns off and a lot of the work we've done in the past has been on oxides. Um, oh, I've said all the yeses there. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, so, and we, 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 delved a little bit into into oxide ceramics with this but but actually the the carbon matrix has proved a lot more interesting and exciting um the uh, uh iron and, and carbon go hand in hand and, and in theory you know if you have enough carbon in your system you should be able to reduce all your iron oxide to iron carbide and have an exact amount of carbon that you need to just do that without any leftover, in theory, that, you know, that should work. But in our experience, we seem to need to have an excess of carbon to actually make the system go um, to get to that iron carbide stage, which in terms of producing a, a phase pure or a pure, um, uh, you're getting a picture for Twitter or something, Brian. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's been a little frustrating. As I said, we moved on to this system and I, I'd recommend you look actually um, the paper with Brian and I from last year in, um, if you just search POW and Schnepp, I think it, it should come on Google. Um, we used uh, Prussian blue, which is an iron cyano complex and you can make nanoparticles out of this, um, of this uh, Prussian blue and embed that in a magnesium oxide matrix and, and get um, decompose it to iron carbide. So you can at least get relatively phase pure iron carbide nanoparticles. Obviously they're not then embedded in a foam, but you can make them, uh, disperse them and make a ferrofluid, which is pretty cool. Um, in terms of the matrix, now actually the, the most exciting science I'm doing at the moment is, is really on the matrix. And we, it's really bizarre because we find with the, um, uh, with the iron carbide particles, they, they, they catalyze the formation of graphite around themselves. So in this gelatin system, they form little capsules of graphite where there's shells of graphite a bit like the layers of an onion around themselves but if we use other systems what happens is those iron carbide particles start to move through the matrix and make little carbon nanotubes um, so a lot of our questions at the moment are on you know why in one system would these things just stay still and make shells and in other systems they move so it kind of became a side project it was more like an observation you know we're trying to make these iron carbide nanoparticles and oh wow suddenly we have a foam we need to study this and oh wow now suddenly we're getting these interesting iron carbide you know these interesting graphite structures well, hey we need to study that too you know uh, you know i started on these systems like 10 years ago now and it just you know through all these side observations we're still studying it and it's uh, and it's uh, it's really interesting i think did i answer all the questions yeah so uh, the um where are we? Uh, never had the samples in the vibrating. Yeah. Okay. So um, the we've done squid. We've not used um, magnetometers. Um, we don't see. Hang on. Is it at the, there's another thing. Um, hang on. Sorry. I'm just. There's, there's like several questions. I'm trying to work out how to answer all of them at once. <laughs> um, yeah, we. Uh, that's a good point. I don't think we ever did squid on the actual original um, gels, just purely because we never saw any nanoparticles. Um, it never occurred to us to to look at the magnetic properties of the of the gel itself. Uh, so certainly, we did it on the later stage samples to look at the properties of the of the iron carbide once we formed it. Um, but that could be uh, that could be really um, that could be really interesting. Uh, um, so HCl and HNO three. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, the snag with these systems. So the question is about um, why HCl and HNO3 would produce different foams. Um, what I'm sort of learning with these systems is 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 learning to accept the complexity of of a biological system, really, um, and and ex and acceptance, I guess, that you know, as as mu as much in detail as I can study these systems, um, 
you know, there, there's always going to come a point where the complexity of the biology just becomes too much, you know, and we have to just accept our limitations. Um, you know, the, I think probably it's to do with some of the chemical reactions that go on this system when they're heated in comparison with the H HCl and the HNO3. I imagine, I mean, certainly we see um, formation of nitrous oxide, which would suggest that the HNO3 or the, or the um, iron nitrates to so the nitrate systems, which is a strong oxidizer, um, is, is oxidizing the gelatin. So I think probably the chemistry, um, <laughs> I've just seen Brian's question. Um, so that I think the chemistry is just different in terms of the way the gelatin decomposes with the HCl. And, uh, and and the HNO3. Something that, and this kind of links to Brian's question, now we understand the foam formation better. Yeah, as I said, we've kind of got sidetracked with, um, with with studying the carbon that, you know, I need to get a student onto working on the on the, on the the foam structures themselves. Um, the custom foam, yeah. So what I find fascinating about these systems, um, and this 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 blew my mind. So if you take a uh, a gelatin with iron nitrate, you get a foam with pretty big bubbles. If you take a gelatin with magnesium nitrate, you get a foam with pretty big bubbles. And if you take a 50-50 mixture of iron and magnesium, you get tiny tiny bubbles. Yeah, Brian remembers this. This is from 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 Japan. You know, and I still actually don't understand why. You know, um, I think I think. <sighs> everything is dependent on, um, on, I think a lot of it's dependent on the rheology, um, of the systems. But as I said, I don't, you know, I don't really have a student to, uh, to spend time on this at the moment. So, um, yeah. Okay. So in your experiments where you probe the different metal nitrates or the pH kept the same in all systems. Yeah. So this, this was a challenge of this system because, um, because we knew that by adding iron nitrate, you know, we weren't just affecting, we weren't just adding iron, basically we were adding iron, we were adding nitrate, we were changing the pH. So we tried to do every experiment we possibly could to, um, to, to, to try and just change one thing at once, um, which, you know, was kind of impossible, but by doing multiple experiments, we tr tried to hope that we could dig down into just into what, how individual features were, were affecting this. Um, so, Yes, we did try adding, uh, so with different metal nitrates, we tried adding, doping it with, say, nitric acid to change, you know, to try and make sure we had the same pH. Honestly, I mean, most metal nitrates are really strongly acidic, um, so we weren't sure that that was, was such a big deal. Something that we did that I think was, was quite nice was this, the experiments with tetramethyl ammonium nitrate. So what you've got there is you've got the nitrate ion, um, but the cation is this tetramethyl ammonium. So hopefully a big cation, pretty soft, hopefully should not interact with the gelatin too much. Um, so, you know, as I said, I hope that by, you know, by trying nitric acid, tetramethyl ammonium nitrate, you know, the, the, the other nitrates, um, we sort of got a handle on, on, on the effects on the system. Something we did observe that I didn't talk about today that was really interesting. Uh, we found that, um, there was a trend in the uh, foaming temperature that followed sort of the periodic table. So the alkali metals would tend to foam at one temperature and then the alkaline earth metals would tend to foam at another temperature. Uh, and then the sort of transition metals uh, was, was a whole other temperature. We actually did make a plot on this. Um, so I think the hardness maybe of the metal cation is also, is also pretty important. In the end, we sort of, um, had to sort of concede that there was a little bit of a, as I say, limitation on what we could do in the system um, because of the complexity of it. <laughs>